You've got John McMullen, Jody McDonald, and Brad Spielberger for Pro Football Focus and OverTheCap.com jumping in with us. Spielberger, what do you do on your bye week? Do you you never have a bye week, so I'm going to ask you to make it up. If you had a bye week, what would you do? If in the middle of the season they just said, Brad, you don't have to crunch any numbers, just get the hell out of here for 10 days, what would you do? Uh, yeah, I think the sick and twisted thing, I still would watch every single football game imaginable. So that's going to happen regardless. But yeah, I would sit there as a fan and just, you know, yell stuff at the TV as opposed to <laughs> kind of thinking through what's going on and having takeaways. Um, but yeah, I'm a, I'm a simple man at the end of the day. Very nice. Uh, simple I man. I like to hear on Birds 365. Three simple men when you join us. Yes. Thanks very much for that. <laughs> yes. Um but uh, one of the reasons we wanted to get Brad today, he did his mid-season general manager rankings, kind of spurred by the change in Las Vegas. Um, no surprise, I guess, Monday Night Football rematch of the Super Bowl. Tier one led by Howie Roseman and the Chiefs' Brett Veach. Um, and by the way, the correlation between those two guys, Andy Reid because he taught them how to build rosters and build football teams. Is that how you see it, Brad? Yeah, and I believe that uh, uh, Howie Roseman taught Brett Veach a lot about football administration yes. and, and, and the contract component. So, yeah, they are, they are definitely linked there in many different ways. Uh, I was laughing at you saying you're waiting for your apology. I was saying it too. Everyone jumps on. You know, it's all about results versus process. Yeah, this process has been sound from the beginning. Yes. yes, they missed on some picks here and there, Jalen Regor and uh, you know, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, et Everybody misses on picks. Everybody. Exactly right. Exactly yeah. right. Which is why yeah. he gets more dart throws, tries to get extra assets. Uh, you know, the Saints trade turning into Jalen Carter, the best recent example <laughs> of an absolute. How does Mickey Lewis have a job, uh, Brad? It, yeah, well, we'll see if he, you know, uh, after the, I mean, the funny thing is the Saints will probably win their division, but, uh, and then lose by 30 at home to the Cowboys in the, in the first round. But um, yeah, so then that's the thing, like, this isn't about just results, even though the results are obviously there for Philadelphia the last couple of years, this is about process more than anything, but obviously good process eventually does lead to good results as it has here. But you know, that type of move, taking Jalen Hurts, even when you knew you, even when you had a quarterback on a big contract, a recent second overall pick, you still had a good quarterback. Now we have Jalen Hurts as one of the top, you know, five, six, seven guys in the NFL. Um, he is a, he is clearly the best GM in the game. Uh, I don't think there's any debate about that whatsoever. Well, uh, that makes us three for three. I'm thinking he's the best GM in football, but I'll play devil's advocate for you. Um, much like in baseball, Johnny loves baseball analogies. Uh, Luis Arise led Major League Baseball in hitting this year with 350, which these days in baseball, 350 is high. You can usually win a batting title in the 320s. He hit 350. Nobody hits a thousand, and Howie doesn't hit a thousand either. I think he missed out leading up to the trade deadline when Rasul Douglas was on the open market and the Eagles weren't willing to pay the price, which turned out to be a third round pick for the player and a fifth round pick as well. So it's not quite the equivalent of a third round pick. And the Eagles are playing guys like Sidney Brown and Eli Ricks at the slot corner these last couple of weeks. Um, I thought when Rasul became available, I didn't think the Packers were going to trade him. That was someone how he should have reached out for. He ends up going to the Bills. He's played pretty well in his two weeks for the Bills. Do you think Buffalo overpaid for Rasul Douglas? It was great in this pass game, um, you know, in particular, obviously a loss for, for them, but he had a bunch of pass breakups against the Broncos. Uh, do I think they overpaid? No. Um, I know, look, I know for a fact all these teams, <laughs> Buffalo, Pittsburgh, Philadelphia, San Francisco, were trying to get Jalen Johnson from the Chicago Bears first. Uh, and then, you know, there was a pivot to Rasul Douglas. I think once they realized the asking price was simply too high for Jalen Johnson services, and, I, you know, I do wonder if, if Green Bay preferred sending him to an AFC team. So I'm not trying to give, like, Howie an excuse here. But, you know, the teams do try to do that. And send well, him to well, a hold on. Time, time out, yep. Lambeau yep. Field. Do you actually think that was in play here in this deal? The Packers are going nowhere fast. In a year where you're in it, you don't want to trade him to someone who might take you out of it. 
they, they're not going to the playoffs, and they know it. No, they're it's gonna, not. No, they're going to make the not, trade with the team that gives them the best deal, not, oh, we got to get them to the other conference. For sure, for sure. I mean, also at this point, you know, the Bills might not even make the playoffs, so that draft pick is going to be about a half round better than Philadelphia's. But, but no, I hear you. That, that's fair. But, um, no, I don't think they overpaid. I think it was a good price. Russell Douglas is on a reasonable contract for this year and next season. There are no guarantees next year, so they can work through a different component uh, or a new deal for him. Um, he can play in the on the inside and on the outside. We've seen success in both spots. I do think he makes more sense out wide. Look, I hear you. I mean, they obviously did trade for Kevin Byard. They have moved a lot of their mid-round picks, you know, with some misses there. Robert Quinn, for example, you know, some of the recent third, fourth, fifths, They've moved four players, some hits, some misses. So, look, I I get it. I do think to a degree, though, you have two starters that are 30-plus at corner already, and I think they want to let these young guys – yeah, they're failing early, sure, but let them play and grow and get better. I think it is a luxury of how good this team is. Like, let them go through those growing pains. You're still 8-1 and one and comfortably leading the conference right now. You know, come playoff time, it could be an issue. Um, but but I think it, there there is a reason to it right now, I believe, as well. Uh, there was so much, you bring up Jalen Johnson, there was so much uh, smoke around him leading up to the trade deadline for multiple teams. But I, I want to boil it down to the Eagles and, and 49ers, Brad, because I think those two teams look at each other as the hurdle to the Super Bowl. Um, and there was talk about Pat Sertan. And both of those teams going after the Eagles loved him coming out. Um, now, Denver was talking about two first round picks, and it seemed to be like almost saber rattling, you know, from the 49ers and in, in, in the Eagles. We can't let them get Sertan. We can't let them get Jalen Johnson. Do you think that any of that played into it? And I think they kind of fell off. Not that Rasul's a bad player, but those two guys are a different level. I love Patrick Sertan, but uh, going back to the GM rankings, how he's too smart to trade two first-round picks for a cornerback. Look, a corner is a great position. It's an important position. If you're trading two first-round picks for a defensive back, you you don't understand the, the proper valuation of assets in today's NFL. And yes, Jalen Ramsey had a great little run with the Rams. I get that. Um, it's not smart. It's it's not a sound process. Maybe the results can be good. And I think Sertan is a t- clear-cut top-five corner in the, in the National Football League. So... I do think that was part of it. I do think those two teams were probably jockeying and didn't want the other to get a player. I think they are clearly the two contenders that probably have a rematch in this conference championship game in a couple of months from now. Um, the Johnson thing, I, I do think, frankly, I think Pittsburgh actually was more in the mix towards the end of the conversation than Philadelphia was, than even San Fran was. Um, and the asking price there was like a second – plus which again i like jalen johnson i'm a bears fan i watch the guy play on an expiring deal i'm probably not giving you a second you know in <clears throat> more draft capital to then extend jalen johnson i'm just not sure it's worth it there so long long answer short like yeah i think they're the, the eagles were keeping tabs and everybody else and obviously the niners do bring in chase young um but but i think getting buyer was important and i think now you just need growth from these young players which I know, you know, it's an all-in year. I get that. But they don't want to go fully all-in and kind of hamper their ability going forward because they still, even after losing some of these veterans, should still be one of the best teams in the conference, uh, you know, next year and beyond. Need your PFF uh, insight on a very specific individual Eagle player, and that's DeAndre Swift. He has all of one touch week one. Comes back, goes for a buck seventy-five week two. Follows it up with a hundred and thirty the week after against the Bucks, and he hasn't had anywhere near a hundred since. There are varying reasons why those numbers peak valley the way that Minnesota just said. We dare you to run the football, and they did right down their throats. And his name is DeAndre Swift. Where is your ranking for DeAndre Swift this year as a running back in the league as compared to? other top running backs. I still think he's number three overall because of those two amazing games and total yards. Where does he rank out after his first half performance as per PFF? 
Yeah, he's been good for sure. Uh, but I think, you know, you look at a guy like Miles Sanders and he's basically not even starting anymore in Carolina. Like it's uh, we are seeing exactly why when there were rumors of the Eagles taking B. John Robinson, I was sitting there chuckling behind my keyboard. Like it, it's not <laughs> so it, was it, I, it, like, yeah, he's good. But like if you look at forced missed tackles or yards after contact per rushing attempt, the two stats that I think we believe actually isolates the running backs value from the offensive line, from the scheme, from everything else, he's good for sure. He's not a top three running back in the NFL or even really close to it. Yeah, he's good. He's a top 15 running back this season. If he goes to Carolina next year, he'll have 400 rushing yards, just like Miles Sanders probably will this year. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. And that's, so let me bring it back to Howie because I, you know, I've been a long time advocate of Howie 2.0 being, and some people say this is 3.0. And that's what I that's what I want to talk about. Howie wasn't always this good, Brad. Um, you know, he he learned on the job. He made a lot of mistakes. You know, we all know Chip Kelly and the power struggle came back, and that's when he kind of turned the corner. I say it all the time, to be fair to other GMs, they don't get that kind of rope. They're they're out the door, they don't get a chance to learn. So that aspect factors in for me. I think people have swung the pendulum too far. Now, how he's great, how he's number one. But man, Jeffrey Lurie is a big part of this because patience, experience matter. And I'll bring it back to your beloved Bears. Look, Ryan Poles is all, he's got, you know, number one pick, maybe another top five pick. Is he going to keep the coach? Is he going to keep the quarterback? Are these decisions, is he going to be there long term? It's difficult to get over that hump where somebody will have the patience for you to develop to be a good GM. It's a phenomenal point. It also, within each individual move, like we always talk about, oh, like I wish my GM, you know, was focused on the long term and not just making short term trying to win now decisions. Not, a lot of GMs can't actually operate that way if they want to keep their jobs. And, and, and they, they wish they had that luxury. They probably, in their mind, agree with the fans that are clamoring for that. But they know if we have a down year and have a losing season when the owner thought we were going to be a playoff team, I may not have a job. So why would I care about stockpiling future draft picks if I'm not going to be the one to make them? It's the classic, classic principal agent problem. And I do think Howie Roseman has the luxury of knowing – hey, if I have a down year or this happens or that happens, I'm not going to get kicked to the curb immediately. They're going to let me actually think long-term here. Um, yeah, no, it's a, it's a phenomenal point. It's very, very true. And it is a luxury that, I don't know, five general managers actually mm. have across the league right now. And it, it's a huge part of his success. But, you know, you talk about 2.0 or 3.0. I also do think he has made changes and, and tangible differences to how he approaches things, um, even ignoring timeline stuff, more so – you know, maybe trusting scouts more and listening to the evaluation, listening to how they want to build the roster out, listening to veterans in the locker room and things of that nature um, that maybe wasn't present in the first couple times around. Brad, I'll go back to your GM ranking list. Where's Joe Douglas? So he's in tier two and it's not really supposed to be like in order. Like he's near the bottom of tier two, but really it's supposed to just be tiers. Um, look, I think Joe Douglas has done a phenomenal job of evaluating talent, obviously outside of quarterback Zach Wilson. I mean, you look at the last couple draft classes they've had in New York, and and yeah, they've had early picks, sure. But, I mean, last year's first round looks to have added three blue-chip talents. Um, Elijah Vera Tucker, if he can stay healthy, is a blue-chip offensive lineman that can play literally every position. You know, you go down Michael Carter, the slot corner, a good later-round pick. Like, they've really hit on a ton of draft picks the last couple of years. Obviously, the Aaron Rodgers trade, trying to you know fix the Zach Wilson situation, it was it was a bit aggressive, and and of course you know the Achilles injury was unforeseeable. But <clears throat> excuse me, he he clearly I think un- understands how to identify talent. Um, it's just you know there's been a lot of injuries and issues at the most important position in all of sports. But trading away Jamal Adams for two first round picks was a slam dunk. Like there's been a lot of good there. Um, so yeah, I, it's unfortunate if they if they had. A, and a league average quarterback, I think they're leading the AFC East right now. Who who do you think is making the decision right now that Zach Wilson is still their quarterback? 
Is it the coaching staff? Is it Douglas? Is it Woody Johnson? Because you're right. It, it, across the board, he just keeps getting hits and hits and hits and hits. But the big at base is loaded, two outs, bottom of the night. Zach Wilson gets another at bat. What the hell? What are they thinking? Who's making that call? It is pretty crazy. I, I mean, to a degree, I think they're all kind of in lockstep with, with the way the messaging is that they probably all agree they'd love to have somebody else, and he is not good enough. But, you know, then I guess I'll go Woody Johnson. Like, I don't think he wants to spend any more cash now that they've lost Aaron Rodgers. The team is second in the NFL in cash spending this year. I want to say they're definitely top three. Um, so... And, like, you know, he probably still wants to give him a chance and see if he can get better. Like, but I don't think Joe Douglas or Robert Sala, if they had their their choice, will want to, to watch any more Zach Wilson. Like, we think it's painful <laughs> for us to watch him play. I promise you it's more painful for them. Yeah, it, well, it has to be. It was painful for the nation to get back-to-back -back New York football. You had the Giants in the, uh, the late afternoon window, then the Jets. It was painful for us all. But I, I got to tell you, Brad, I was a little bit surprised. I was looking at your tier one. As you said, it's, you know, how he's not necessarily number one. It's just a tier, but I'm going to put him at number one. It we're we're going to put him at number one on Birds 365. But I was surprised Jerry Jones is in there. Now, I do give him credit. And you, you also put Will McClay as the vice president of player personnel, who's, you know, probably more responsible, obviously, for the scouting aspect. And you bring up a good point. Um, they got a lot of homegrown talent on that team. It's a very good roster. They made some better moves with veteran players, uh, especially with Stephon Gilmore. But, you know, I don't see, despite his reputation, and you mentioned windows, uh, and, and some guys are more window-oriented. I don't, I don't see a sense of urgency ever in Dallas. Like, and, and and that bothers me. I I can't even put my finger on it. But when you're that gifted and that talented up and down the roster, and you kind of just stagnate, it's weird. It's a little bit weird to me. Totally. No, I get it. And, and I know that people want to see, you know, playoff results uh, again is driving this article or something like that, but it, it is a sustainable competitor. And I get they have not gotten over the hump and they get their ass kicked by the Niners or whoever, or the Eagles come playoff time. Oh, well, they play Philly pretty well the last couple of years, but um, you, look, they are the, like first, the most homegrown team in the entire national football league. My biggest issue with them, biggest gripe with them had been not getting the early extensions done, like how he was killing them with Josh Sweat and Jordan Mailata and insert 10 other names. And they're sitting there and waiting until franchise tags for every top player on their roster. And we finally saw this offseason then pivot away from that and sign a bunch of guys to early deals. You know, unfortunately, Javon Diggs gets hurt, but I thought he was playing the best football of his career and signed an extremely team-friendly contract. And then you mentioned the urgency. Agreed, of course. But I do think you finally saw you're trading for Brandon Cooks, who had 173 yards and a touchdown this week, and mm -hmm. Stephon Gilmore, who I think has been good all year. Like, they finally did do that. I think they finally said, all right, look, we have a really good team. We're going to pay Micah Parsons soon. We're going to pay C.D. Lamb soon. Like, we got to go, not go all in, but we got to push the envelope a little bit, and they finally did it. So, yeah, I've had a bunch of people kind of mock that one. Look, I get it. They haven't gotten the big game. They're America's team, so everyone kind of is annoyed with the Dallas Cowboys and, and wants more from them. They're a 12-win team like every single year, and their draft-wise, draft, draft, draft wise, they are the best team in the NFL over the last decade. It's kind of not even debatable. I get we want more from free agency. They don't really do it. We want more trades and all that. I, I totally understand it. But to build a consistent playoff caliber team, they're, they're as good as anyone. Right, but you got to be able to get up and over the top, and it's it's frustrating for John McMullen, Jordan McDonald, Brad Spiller. Well, we'll wait to the playoffs. Go ahead, play your 17. Just get them out of the way so we can go ahead and see what you do in the playoffs because that's the only thing that matters because that's really <laughs> where the Cowboys are at right now. All right, overall rankings. We talk about power rankings probably too much on this show. And, oh, you know what? Screw it. Different question. Your thoughts on ESPN's power index because PFF is based on scouting and analytics and the combination and the marrying of the two and that – ESPN has this, I'll choose my word carefully, stupid power index rating that they just put numbers into a computer and come up with a thousand simulations played or whatever. 
And somehow they have the Eagles as the seventh best team in the NFL. And it hasn't changed. Teams win, teams lose. Eagles just continue. And the Eagles stay at seven. So it makes no sense to me. Maybe you understand it better than I do because every week I feel I need to read the little that they give you on how they actually compile these numbers. And I still don't understand it. What do you think of ESPN's power rating index? So I'll say this because, you know, you're going to get me in trouble here too. I, I, I have not been able to look under the hood of what they do. So I obviously don't want to say anything extremely, you know, confidently in any direction. But I will say this. Um, when I see it used, you know, you go in the app and it'll give you the percent each team's going to win a game. Like if you go into a matchup and it says like, we think X team has a 65% chance. It's like a little circle where it's like filled in. Yep. All I can say is this. It's clearly not being regret to use simpler terms. Like it's not being looked at the market. Go look at Vegas. Look at the market. Look at what you have. And I'm not saying you have to just abide by what the market says, but adjust what you're doing. So it's closer in line with what the market clearly dictates, because I mean, that's what Vegas is doing at their entire operation is, is power ranking these teams head to head, but also overall looking at futures markets, etc. I think there is a, there's just not enough of like, yeah, come up with your own model, have your own opinions. But at the end of the day, if it, if it's that much different from what the market is telling you, you probably should go back under the hood and tweak some things and I don't know if they're doing that maybe to the fullest extent they should be. So, uh, okay, fair so enough. I, I, enough. I can guarantee you that because the Eagles have been locked in at seven yeah. for I, six straight weeks. I, I, my, my policy on power rankings, Jody knows, Brad, if you don't like one, turn the page to the next. Who cares? Style points don't matter. Um, are you winning football games? Are you losing football games? Um, that's what matters. Now you try to predict, and obviously there were a couple teams last year, Minnesota, most notably the New York Giants, where we all said, look, this is not sustainable in, in Minnesota's case, winning one score games. And sure enough, they regresses right back to the mean. The New York Giants are probably the worst team in football this year. Um, and, and a lot of things have gone wrong for them. Um, uh, but I'll, I, I guess I'll end it with the Bears because the Bears interest me, and I've been hard on the Bears, Brad. I admit, uh, full disclosure, I, I, I don't understand some of the things Ryan is doing, but he's got them set up with a ton of cap space, two top 10 picks. Justin Fields is set to come back this week. Do they want him back? Do they want to win football games? How do you, how do you sort of – Get that NBA mentality in the NFL. Should you have it? Should they be trying to win games? Is Matt Eberflus even going to be there? Is Justin Fields even going to be there? If not, they're going to affect their future. How, how, how difficult is that for Ryan Poles? I mean, I will say this. They are they have three wins, and two of them were not even with Justin Fields in the lineup. So there's not really a you know guarantee he's going to elevate well, the team. That, 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 look, I yeah. do think he's better than Tyson Bajan yeah. um, by a comfortable margin, and, and he um, has shown some good football, like, unfortunately, right before he got hurt. But <laughs> having the Carolina pick is huge, and you obviously need them to just lose every single game. Yeah. Kyler Murray coming back is fantastic news. Um, the Giants and Patriots playing each other is great. As a Bears fan, I hope the Giants somehow find a way to win that game because they are the worst team in football by a mile right now. Um, and so I just I think you still do, as much as I think they are going to draft a quarterback, I think you need to see what you have in Justin Fields to the fullest extent, see if he can be a different player over these last six, seven weeks, whatever it is. Um, they play the Browns, which you know tied to this morning's news. It's kind of unfortunate if you want them to lose every game. They obviously have a better chance in that matchup now. But, you know, I do think, like, if you win a one extra game and go from picking fourth to sixth or, I don't know, seventh to ninth, like, that's not the biggest deal. You need Carolina's pick to be first or second because I do think those two quarterback prospects are in a tier of their own fairly comfortably right now. But, yeah, you can't full-on tank unless, you know, like the only – True tanking move we ever see we ever saw was our good pal Nate Sudfeld in Philadelphia against the Washington Commanders. Um, that's the only time I've ever actually seen it. Again, shout out Howie. Um, but uh, no, 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 shout out Jeffrey, the unstoppable yeah. Nate Sudfeld. 
Yeah, <laughs> I think the owner was involved in that decision. That yeah, you're probably right. Um, but yeah, so like I get the question, and I, and I and I, I share some of the concerns. I just I don't think it's gonna automatically make them win a bunch of games. He was what one in five. Oh, you know, as that's a starter anyway. Point. That's probably the best point. They're not <laughs> yeah. very good with them. So yeah. yeah, I just a little because he can make a play, win a game. Yeah. You know, you know, I, it, it's tough for me because. I, I I don't like tanking. I don't I I I don't think it it helps long term. I I do believe you know. I always say Dennis Green told me way back in the day, winning is a habit. I think losing is a habit. I think that that's real. You don't want to get too ensconced in it. But boy, you know, I if if you know you're not, and I guess they don't know, but I think they should know. They're going to draft a quarterback. I, I think they probably know. I mean, although it's interesting, if you don't get a top two pick, I do wonder what they do. Um, I thought J.J. McCarthy could maybe step up and be that number three, threw the ball eight times against Penn State, including a third and goal from the 10. They ran the football. Zero yeah. times um, in the second half. He went the entire second half without throwing the football. Didn't they oh, run yeah. it like Zero. 30 straight times? 30, yeah, they ran 30 straight times. Great, and I get yeah. they didn't need to throw the ball to win. But you still, I think if you had, if you thought the kid was a top three pick, you probably let him throw the ball on third and goal from the 10-yard line. So yeah. um, he One still has the Ohio like. State game. Yeah, yeah. He still has the Ohio State game. Maybe it turns it. But, like, Michael Penix, Bo Nix are 25 and have had injuries, yeah, like I not interested. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think Sanders comes out. Quinn Ewers is not going to come out. It shouldn't come out because I don't think he's a top 50 pick at this point. Anyway, whole separate conversation. I think that if, if Caleb Williams or Drake May are available, they take one of them. Um, but, yeah, their own pick, you know, moving a couple of picks down, I don't think they're super concerned about. Again, back to our original conversation. Yeah. I think Are you frightened at all by Caleb Williams in this season? Are you frightened at all by Caleb? Not the crying stuff, not any of that yeah. nonsense, but I I just don't think he's learning a lot under Lincoln Riley. I think there's going to be a lot of learning at the NFL level. I'm a little so, more concerned. Yeah, no, I, 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 with you 100%. I could care less about the, the off-field stuff. The, the the holding on the ball, I mean, he has the highest average time to throw in the in, in college football or up there. Um, it's also off the charts. Even if you look at other prospects, and, like, that's Justin Fields' biggest issue is that he just holds on to the ball forever, leads the NFL in average time to throw again this season. And, uh, look, there are some, you know, like Jalen Hurts is up there in that stat. Lamar Jackson's up there in that stat. But they also don't take a lot of bad sacks. And when they do need to get rid of the football, they do it. Um, you know, whereas Fields is was missed the last month because he got sacked against the Blitz because he didn't know, you know, he didn't know he was hot to the left side. Anyway, it is a concern for sure. I came into this season being like, Caleb Williams is the clear cut number one. There's probably no chance that changes. Drake May, I think, is closing that gap on a weekly basis. Not that he's perfect either. Um, I still have Caleb one, but May is now a very close two uh, at this point. Agree with you there. All right, Brad. Last question. Matchup specific strength of one team over the other. What do you think will be the key element as to who wins Chiefs Eagles Monday night? Eagles running the football. So the Chiefs defense is awesome. I think it's a top five unit in the NFL at this point, but they are still very susceptible against the run. Bottom five in, in success rate allowed against the run this season. Um, and and uh, I think that's the key because also, you know, of course, all the cliches, you keep Mahomes off the field, you control time of possession, all, all those things that, you know, are true. Um, I think that is the key to this game for Philadelphia because – Look, the secondary con does concern me in Philadelphia. Like, don't get me wrong. Like, I, ha I have concerns about their secondary, no question about it, even though the Chiefs, you know, have Travis Kelsey and, and really nothing else at receiver. Um, but, yeah, that's the key for me is run the run the ball down their throat and just sustain eight-minute drives, cap them off with touchdowns. I think that's how you win this game. And I think Nick Bolton being out is a key. That yes. they, they miss him badly. And yes. he's not going to be back for this week's game. All right. Uh, always a pleasure, brother. Appreciate it. How he uh, appreciate your ranking, John. Appreciate your ranking because it lets him do another victory lap. That how he is the best general manager in yeah. the NFL. We didn't oh. we didn't correlate that at PFF underscore Brad. Make sure you follow Brad on X. Uh, read him uh, his mid season GM tears. Uh, phenomenal read. You get the input of why Howie and Brett Beach are so good at what they do. And good. We'll see thank you guys. All right, down there on the field, shaking hands before the game. Always a pleasure, Brad. Thank you very Thanks, much. Thanks, Brad. Brad Spielberger, uh, PFF, and over the cap. We didn't really even talk about the cap. There was too much on-field football stuff to get the cap things because – 
doesn't really matter at this stage. But before you know it, this season will be over. Go, hey, wait, what, what kind of cap moves did they make at the end of the year? I was very good at that, too, by the way, uh, with help from his friends. He's got other good cap consultants in that Eagle Front office. At Jake Eagle. Rosenberg, shout out. He does. Uh, they get outstanding uh, maneuvering of the cap, like I would say. That's one thing that makes him potentially the best front office in the NFL. All right, McMullen McDonald, we got to come back and put a bow on the show. Stay here on Birds.